to Baiju Social Science classes once again. How are all of you, my friends, doing? Well, I hope you're doing great because I am fantastic. And today I'm very excited to continue with our chapter on federalism. Now, you know that we had done part one of this chapter last week. So let's do a quick recap of our last session. So, in the last session, which is basically part one of this chapter, we learned about what is federalism and we spoke about the features of federalism of, or a federation. Now, just in case you haven't attended or watched that session or just in case you don't remember any of the important points, you can always go and check out the part one video or part one of the session of federalism on our 9th to 10th channel. And in fact, I would recommend that you do because what we're doing today is like a continuation of that particular uh, section. So watching that video is very, very important, right? Now, Let's talk about what we're going to do today. Today, we're going to be covering two more topics in this chapter, which is types of federalism. And we're going to be talking about what makes India a federal country, right? Now, last time, if you remember, we, I had, in my last session, I had asked you, is India a federal country? Well, the answer to that question is yes, India is a federal country. And we are going to be talking more about this today. So what are we waiting for? Let's start off with our first topic for today, which is the different types of federalism. Now, can you tell me how many types of federations do we have? If you know the answer, let me know in the comment section below. I'm sure you know the answer, right? I'm sure that most of you are watching this video after already having gone through this chapter. So basically, a federation, depending on the uh, historical context of which it was formed, could be of two major types. This could either be number one, a coming together federation or number two, a holding together federation. Now, are these terms uh, overwhelming you or confusing you? <laughs> well, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to make these terms easy peasy for you. So let's take a look at these two divisions individually and then you will understand what these two are about. So let's start first with the coming together federation. Now, if you observe this diagram that we have over here on screen, you can see that A, B and C, all these are three independent states or basically uh, sovereign states, right? Three separate independent states. Now, let us assume that each of these A, B and C is under the fear of being annexed or colonized or attacked by a bigger and stronger country. So what do you think they could do these independent states in this particular situ situation? Well, they could strategize and they could all come in together and form a union so that they are less vulnerable or less weak to attacks. So when they pull in all their uh, forces together, the federation thus formed would be a coming together federation. So basically, in a coming together federation, the states have decided to pool in their sovereignty, pool in their resources, and they do so along with retaining their own individual identity. So let me put this down. This is important. Individual identities are uh, retained. One minute. Identity is retained. Sorry, I'm saying it a little loudly, but every time I write, sometimes I make spelling mistakes, so I like to say it loudly. So basically, they're all retaining their individual identities and they have come in together, right? They pool their resources. Now, along with this, these independent states usually have equal powers and they are not weak as compared to the center. They're all equally powerful, right? Now, what are some examples of this type of federation? Some examples of this type of federation are Switzerland, USA, as well as Australia, right? This was about coming together federation. Now, let's move ahead and talk about the second type of federation, which is the holding together federation. Now, 
unlike what we saw earlier in the coming together federation where the states decided to form a union here it is actually different it's a large country that already exists that decides to divide its power between the center and the constituent states right so here the power is divided right so basically let me explain this a little bit more in a holding together federation it is the country that decides to divide its powers between the constituent states and the national government right so it's sort of like the power is with the center and it sort of divides it now in this kind of federation it is the central government that does tend to be more powerful vis-a-vis -vis the states. So as you can see over here, if you can see even from the diagram, you, you will notice that the constituent states might have unequal powers. Some may have more, some may have less, right? So this is what is a holding together federation. Now, some examples of a holding together federation would be Spain and Belgium. Uh, and that brings me to uh, a question, which I'm sure you already guessed I'm going to ask you. I want to ask you, what type of federation is India? Even if you didn't know it, apply what I've just taught you over here. What is a coming together federation and what is a holding together federation? Think about it and let me know your answers in the comment section below. Right? In fact, put the answer in now because I'm going to be revealing this in a little bit. Okay? So, with that, let us start our next topic where we will now discuss the characteristics that make India a federal country. Now, do you recall that one of the features of a federal type of government is that its existence and authority are guaranteed by the constitution? I had told you this in the last session. So, let us see how our Indian constitution guarantees the same. Now, first of all, the constitution mentions, our constitution, Indian constitution, mentions that India is a union of states. However, the word federalism is not mentioned in the constitution. So, isn't that strange? So, what makes India a federation then? Well, you see, despite the fact that it's not mentioned in the constitution, the word federation is not mentioned in the constitution, the spirit of federalism is very much and very well captured by our constitution. So let us see how. Basically in India, we have a three-tier government and they all have their own respective jurisdiction, right? Now we know a federation is one that has two or more levels of government and we have that and that makes India a federation, right? Now, talking about the constitution, the constitution has clearly provided legislative powers for all of these uh, three different levels of government. Now, what exactly does this mean? Well, basically it means that these powers have been distributed between the union government and the state governments into three categories or lists, which is Number one, the union list, number two, the state list, and number three, the concurrent list. So let us have a closer look at this distribution and then you will understand how the powers have been divided. So if you take subjects like um, defense or communications or, uh, or, or foreign affairs or banking, now all of these topics or subjects are obviously we know of national importance. So subjects of national importance, they come under the union list. And only the central government has the right to make laws related to these particular subjects that affect the whole country, right? Now let's move on to the state list. The state list on the other hand contains subjects like uh, police, trade, commerce, agriculture, which obviously would be very different state to state, right? So in this case, only that particular state government has, uh, basically the state government makes laws on these particular subjects and that would be sensible because these things would differ state to state, right? So it is that particular state government that makes those laws for that particular state. Then we have a third category of subjects. Let me put here first state government makes laws, okay? Now, we have a third category of subjects that fall under what we call the concurrent list. Now, these would include subjects like um, marriage or forests or adoption. So who do you think can create laws regarding these subjects? 
Well, in the case of these subjects, we have both the center and the state that can make laws on these particular subjects, right? And these are the subjects in the concurrent list. Now, I have a question. Let us assume that uh, the center and the state have both made different laws about the same issue. Then whose law would we follow? Well, in case of a conflict, the laws made by the center prevail in regards to the subjects in the concurrent list, right? In case of conflict, we have to follow the laws made by the center. I told you earlier that in terms of, uh, 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 you know, in some federations in I'm not going to give you this answer actually. <laughs> okay, I'll give you the answer. In terms of a holding together federation, I have said that the center is more powerful. So now I'm giving you the answer that India is a holding together federation. Okay. Now, talking about these three lists, we have the union list, the state list and the concurrent list. Now tell me, do you think that these lists contain all the possible subjects? For example, if you see, there were um, no, there was no IT technology or no IT laws when the constitution was newly framed, right? I mean, IT is a new subject. So where would such kind of subjects fall? Well, such subjects that are not mentioned in any of the three lists that we discussed are called residuary subjects and the center holds the power to make laws on them and there is a separate list called the residuary list, right? Okay, now moving ahead and talking about um, make it, India as a federal country. What else makes India a federal country? So basically, I told you just a little bit, bit earlier that India acts as a holding together federation. Now, what exactly does this mean? This means that its constituent states are not equal in power. Now, you see, in India, there are some states which have more power, some have less power. In fact, some states are actually given special powers. Which, uh, they're given special powers by something called Article 371 of the Constitution. Now, this is done due to either some social or historical circumstance of that particular state. Now, let us take the case of Nagaland, for example. Now, in Nagaland, we have the Nagaland Article 371A, which is applicable to that particular state to accommodate the Naga customary law and procedure along with their religious and social practices so that nobody else can sort of interfere with these religious practices or social practices. It's actually done to protect that particular state. So people belonging to such states are also given other preferential uh, treatment uh, in terms of uh, maybe even like in employment, for example, employment and gov government services. So they have some special privileges or special powers. Then uh, in terms of examples of this kind of, uh, these kind of states, you have states like um, Assam, Nagaland, Mizoram and Arunachal Pradesh, all of which fall under this special category of Article 371. Now, we have spoken about states having special powers. If you see in a country like India, on the other hand, we have something called union territories, which actually have very little power. Now, do you know why? Because these areas, which we call union territories, they're actually too small to be considered a state or to be granted statehood. So they, while they are actually socially or culturally different enough, so they, they can't really be merged with the existing, sta existing states and which is why they have been given the, the title of union territory, right? So it is for this reason that the central government directly rules such union territory. So I'm going to put this down for you over here. The central government has special powers in running these areas. And you have examples of union territories in terms of Chandigarh, Laksh Lakshwadweep, Delhi. These are some examples of union territories. Clear? Okay, I think after discussing so many points, it definitely seems like our constitution has provided us with a foolproof plan, right, of, of federalism. But let us say that one day we have the center that wakes up and decides to change this constitution in its favor and take away all the powers from the states. Is that possible? Well, let me tell you, it seems like our constitution has made an arrangement for something like this as well. You see, since federalism is the basic feature of our constitution, it cannot be changed unilaterally by any one tier. To change any provision regarding federalism, you need a two 
two third majority which is required from both houses of parliament which is namely the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha two third majority from each apart from that you also need ratification by at least half the number of the total state legislatures so you see it's a little bit more complicated you can't have anyone they are just waking up and changing something so basically this provision makes it very difficult to change federal provisions right so we are just about to close this session but before ending the session let us quickly summarize what we did today basically we studied two types of federalism which are basically the coming together federation i'm just putting coming over here and the holding together federation right uh, we also went ahead and we learned about what makes india a federal country right well that's it for this session but before i close for today i want to tell you if you um, haven't yet uh, enrolled to take this exam which is the baiju scholarship test please go ahead and do this if you go ahead and take this exam you can actually go ahead and um, you know win an all expense uh, paid trip to australia so please go ahead and do this apart from that we have some other good news the baiju's mini learning program is now free but it is now free for only the first 500 users every week so quickly quickly click on the link that you have in the description box and go and put in the code yt first and you can avail of this program absolutely free but you have to do it fast all right so that's pretty much it from me today for more such sessions tune into uh, our byju's 9 to 10 channel i'm going to be putting up lots of sessions for you and definitely do not forget to like share and subscribe to our channel i'm going to see you very very soon bye bye